welcome out our guest speaker for this weekend, Neil Mammon. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank, I love this church. You know, um, some of you have heard me speak here. I visited a few times. Uh, right in the middle of COVID was when we first visited. And the first time I spoke, um, Pastor Rick invited me to speak. They gave me this great sweatshirt. And I'm like, wow, they must like me because it says, love Neil Mammon. What? Uh, and it was just, uh, so I felt really welcome. But thank you. Thank you. I love your pastor. He's great. He, uh, He's a man after my own heart. We share a lot of the same rebellion against the machine kind of thing, and you know him well for that. So uh, let me ask you a question. Let's start with asking a question. What was the first time the Bible, whoops, yeah, where was the first time the gospel that, what, where, where, what was the first time in the gospel was hinted at in the Bible, in the Old and New Testaments? Genesis. Genesis. Exactly. Genesis what? Genesis 3.15. And this is God talking to Satan. He says, I will put enmity, a war, between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. You know, it's always uh, tough for a pastor to let somebody speak during, uh, you know, around Easter time, you know, Palm, you know, um, Good Friday, Palm Sunday, and this being Palm Sunday, I'm really honored to be here because I want to talk about something that's going to be really relevant in when he preaches for you in Easter, and that is, did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead? So today's talk is the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So we're going to talk about, did Jesus really exist? Was he really God? And did he really rise from the dead? A few years ago, I was uh, forced to go on a business trip to Israel. Oh. I have to give you the background of it. See, I, I, I was in the early days of MPEG encoding, and I worked for the company that invented the very first MPEG encoder. And a few years before that, I and a friend of mine had designed the very first MP3 player. So we're working for this company, and they'd, so we, I was sent around the world to design MPEG, the very first MPEG encoders. Now, you have to understand, it took 14 chips this big to do one D1, which is about a quarter of HD, right? And, and we'd, I put it on a board this big, and so uh, now your phone can do eight of those. So, yeah, you see how the technology has come. But anyway, so I would fly around the world helping all these companies build the very first encoders. And one of the companies was an Israeli company. And I, um, I, I asked the, uh, the guy, said, his name was Asher. I said, Asher, you got to come figure out a way where I just have to fly to Israel to help you guys out. He goes, oh, yeah, no problem. Calls up my boss and he says, hey, can you send Neil over? We need help in getting this part to work. And, and so my boss says, hey, uh, we, we have a request from the company Israel. Can you fly there? Would that be okay? I'm like, yeah, I suppose I'll have to. <laughs> and so I get there, and, but, but they really put me to work because they're having this encoder. It's not working the way they think it should be. So I have to look at their design. I have to say, it's always hard when you study other people's designs. They're like, okay, now what'd you guys do here? Why'd you do that? And so I go through it. And every night, every day we're working on it. And every night I would go back to the hotel and I would look at the map of Israel and go, here we are. Because I was in Tel Aviv, right? That was where the company was. And Tel Aviv is not this really pretty city. Uh, and I wanted to go to Jerusalem. So I'd look at the map and go, wow, that's halfway across the country. How am I going to get there? So, so one of the days I said, uh, I said Asher, um, you, know, you know, I really want to go to Jerusalem. It would be so nice if I could just visit Jerusalem while I'm here. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go there for dinner. <laughs> like, dinner? It's halfway across the country. He goes, yeah, yeah, uh, maybe with traffic. If we leave at the right time, we can get there in 50 minutes. It's 70 miles across the country, guys. This is a tiny country. And yet the focus of the whole world is on it. And then we get to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is even smaller. I mean, the whole city of Jerusalem is probably about three-quarters of a mile from one and the other. And in fact, during Jesus' time, it was even shorter because the wall was right there on that where that red line is. And then finally, I get this, uh, you know, so while we were there, Yom Kippur hits, right? So Yom is day, Kippur is atonement, so the day of atonement hits. And all the Jews are not working, so Asher says, hey, you know, um, we're not working for the next two days, so I've arranged for a, uh, a uh, private tour guide to take you all around Israel, so I get to sit in this Mercedes Benz, <laughs> we get a private tour, I get a private tour of Israel, and... Um, and so, and, and the guy says, but the guy's going to be a Muslim because, you know, all the Jews don't work on that day. Uh, and he says, how's your Arabic? See, I grew up in the Middle East and in Sudan. 
So I said, yeah, it's, I've lost most of it. He said, yeah, well, you'll get along great with him. And it was great. I had this great time with this guy. He was a great, you know, we, we made, became friends. And he would, he would, you know, take me all around the city. And so we get to this one place outside Jerusalem. It's like that, remember that red star? It's right outside the city walls. And I get in there. And, and now this is Yom Kippur. So there's a lot of Jews visiting the holy places. And many of these Jews have come from other countries because they're, they're coming there for Yom Kippur. So we go in there, and there's a bunch of Jews in there. And I can't go in uh, without a yarmulke, right? Now, I don't wear those things, so they give me a little cardboard one, so I look like Laurel and Hardy, you know, like a little thing on my head, just tiny little hat. And I, I guess I have a big head compared to many Jews. I don't know. So I go in there, and I'm wearing this thing, and I'm balancing on my head, and I ask the, the guide, I say, so what is this place? Because a, there's a big blue mound, and there's a bunch of... Uh, People doing, you know, the, the Orthodox Jews, they're, they're reciting prayers, and a bunch of tourists are also reciting prayers. And he says, oh, oh, that's, that's the tomb of David. And whenever tourists come from out of town, this is one of the holy places to visit. I teach apologetics. Apologetics comes from the word apologia. It does not mean to say you're sorry, but it comes from 1 Peter 3.15. that says, always be prepared to give an apologia to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, that word apologia does not mean to apologize. It means to argue or to defend or to provide an explanation. So always be willing to provide a defense or an explanation. And in line with that, what apologetics is, is the evidence and defense of the rational faith of Christianity using facts, logic, history, science, philosophy, and reasoning. No other religion has an apologetics like this. Every other religion depends on blind faith. And so they say, you know, you've just got to believe it. And then what's interesting about that is that Christianity is the only religion that says blind faith is wrong. And so my ministry is called No Blind Faith. And why can I say blind faith is wrong? Because if you look at the Old Testament in the Bible, God punishes the Israelites for having blind faith. He says, you know, you follow idols that they have done nothing for you, but I led you out of the land of, of Egypt. I parted the Red Sea. I what? I dropped the walls of Jericho. I fed you in the wilderness. He gives you physical miracle, a physical miracle, a physical miracle. And, and then he says, and so you should follow me. But when you follow those idols, you have blind faith in them. They don't know anything for you. And he sends them into exile for 70 years. By the way, if you notice the Jewish history, after the Jews came back from exile, they never once worshipped false idols. Some of them weren't worshipping anything, <laughs> but they never, there were no false idols in Israel in Jesus' time. So I teach a number of things, and there are six steps I go with most people. One is I prove that faith should never be blind, but two, I also prove that God exists without using the Bible, using science. And I wrote the book, and and Sam talked about it, who's Agent X. We, we also have a children's version, but I think we're out of them. Um, and they can tell you where to get hold of them if you want. Uh, and then we prove the New Testament is accurate using archaeology and manuscript evidence. I don't know if you know this, but did you know that we can prove that the Bible that we have today is exactly the Bible that they wrote 2,000 years ago, the New Testament, through manuscript evidence. And it's amazing. It's amazing history. And then I, I go, the next thing I do is I prove Jesus really existed and rose from the dead using all the above. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So throughout the talk, I'll talk about some of the stuff that we've already talked about, which you would have heard normally. And then number five, I explain why Christ had to die and why God must punish sin. I mean, why, why does Jesus have to die? What, what's with all that blood and gore? And, you know, why does somebody else dying for my sin pay for my sin? And so but we'll actually mention that today because that's all tied in. And then number six is I explain how evil and God can coexist. And I actually did that talk here a few years ago. So given all this, my claim is that Christianity isn't a blind faith, it's a rational faith built on a solid historical and logical foundation. And here's the problem with that. Most people don't know that. And so if you have kids or grandkids, when they get out of church and they go to college, or when they get out of your home and they go to college, many of them, it turns out 75% of them leave the faith. Why? Because they have an emotional faith in Jesus. But when they get to college or wherever they get to work, they have a new emotions that replace the old emotions. And so they, and then they say, well, you know, I'm not an emotional person, which they are, but uh, they say, no, I, I just could use science and logic and reason. Well, that's the beauty about Christianity. And so we wrote a book, I and my uh, 
my two kids, my younger two kids, uh, they were six and eight at the time. Now they're two years older. It took us a while to get this out. Uh, we wrote this daily apologetics for kids. This is volume one. There's just one month. There's, um, eventually we'll have all, I mean, you have, um, it does 20 days of apologetics. And it allows you to interact with them and get your kids from the ages of six thinking about this. And I know it works because it worked on my kids. <laughs> Right? In fact, they were, you know, my, my six-year-old was walking around the house reading it, going, hey, Dad, you made a spelling mistake here. I'm like, it's like, I knew that. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the book uh, that I, I taught, that I, that, brought, uh, that I preached, I preached on this book, uh, I think it was like four years ago. Um, it was that rebellion book. It's called Jesus is Involved in Politics. Why aren't you? Why isn't your church? Most pastors didn't really like that, and I'm kind of a black sheep now, but your pastor loved it and invited me to speak. I, and we're actually out of those books, but they can tell you where to get them. But here's, here's the thing. I want to talk about this one. Who's Agent X? Because it's relevant to what we're going to talk about. So this book, when I wrote it, it was Proving God Exists Without Using the Bible. It just uses science. And, just, and what's important about this, because we're going to refer to this. In the book, we talk about the Big Bang, how the Big Bang is the greatest attestation of, of God. Because before the Big Bang, atheists thought the universe had existed forever, so you didn't need a God. And suddenly the Big Bang theory comes along, and they, lower, they mock it, and that's why it's called the Big Bang. It was a mockery of it. And then they finally they had to accept it, and, and, and so the, the reality is that they didn't like the fact that if you have a Big Bang, you need a Big Banger. So they fought it. And so this book uses science to prove. But here's one of the things that's very interesting. At the point of the Big Bang, we can calculate, and they've done all these things, they can calculate that there were up to 10 dimensions. There were 10 dimensions? Yeah, well, you know, height, length, breadth, right? And time is the fourth dimension. It's half a dimension because you can't only go forward in it. But there's, those are the four dimensions. But those are what we call the four natural dimensions. But science has calculated that there are six other, what kind of dimensions? Super natural dimensions. And you go, well, Neil, that's just, that's a theory. No, no, no. We spent $3 billion and built the Large Hadron Collider to send a particle into one of those dimensions. Science, mathematics has calculated it. Science has calculated it. Now we just need to find the physical evidence of it. So that's very important because we are going to talk about that because that's going to be very, very significant. So let me ask you this. Is Christianity based only on the teachings of Jesus? Did Jesus come to show us the way to God? What did Jesus say? He said, I am what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus didn't come to show us the way. He came to what? To be the way. You see, if there was no Jesus, there, was, there is no Christianity. If there is no Muhammad, you can still have Islam because you have the Quran. If there is no Buddha, you can still have his teachings, so you still have Buddhism. If there is no Krishna, well, actually, the Hindus don't really care about anything. It's just believe whatever you want to believe and you're happy, Right? But in Christianity, if you don't have Christ, you don't have Christianity because Jesus didn't come to show us the way. He came to be the way. And part of that is that he had to prove that he was God. And the only way he could do that was doing something that nobody else could do, and that is to die and rise from the dead. So let me ask you this. If you're not a Christian here today, I'm not going to ask you to make any emotional decisions, but it might be emotional. But I'm going to ask you to think logically and rationally. If I could prove to you that there's a high degree of confidence that Jesus actually and physically rose from the dead, which would mean that his claim to be God would be true, would you be willing to accept his claims despite the consequences of that decision? A lot of people have consequences. They're like, well, you know, if I, if I obey, if I say that God exists, then I can't do this. Or if I say that God exists, that means my mom isn't in heaven or my brother's in heaven. Or, you know, you, there are all these consequences. But if the facts lead you to the truth, the truth will set you free. So today we're going to talk about why Jesus is different from the other good teachers. Well, actually, we just mentioned that. I already told you that. So the next thing we're going to talk about is, did Jesus really exist? And the third one is, did he really rise from the dead? So let's look at if Jesus really existed. How many people here today think that Jesus has only talked about the Bible and nowhere else? How many people think that Jesus was never mentioned by other historians? How many people think that Jesus was just a legend who never existed? I've had so many atheists, so many non-Christians come and tell me, oh yeah, it was just a legend. It was all that. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you evidence that Jesus existed, had a brother, was crucified, and died under Pontius Pilate without ever using the Bible. 
Let's talk, let's go look at Cornelius Tacitus. Tacitus was a Roman historian, right? And he writes this, and he was not a Christian. In fact, he hated the Christians. I don't know if he hated it, but he despised the Christians. Christus from whom this name has its origin suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. Then there was Josephus. Flavius Josephus was a Jewish man. He was actually in the army, the Jewish army. And then he, when he realized that the Jewish army was going to be decimated by the Romans and during the siege of Jerusalem, he decided to defect and become a Roman. And he became a Roman historian. And he writes this. So again, not a Christian, not a believer. He says, Ananias the high priest convened the meeting of the Sanhedrin and brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called a Christ and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. Jesus was a real human being. He really existed. And I've shown you that all these facts are there, and I didn't even use the Bible for that. And that's not the only one. We have a whole bunch of them. We have Suetonius, Pliny, Talus, and the Talmuds. And, and there's a number of others, too. So Jesus really existed. But, okay, so Jesus existed. But was he really God? I mean, I exist. Am I God? No. In fact, uh, people, other people exist and they claim to be God. Does that make them God? No. So was he really God? And that's what we need to understand and study today. Did he really rise from the dead? Because if he rose from the dead, then that would prove that he really is God. Because it's not something anybody can do. Those of you who heard me speak last time, remember the story I told you about my daughter, Caroline Lewis. If you remember it, she... Um, Lived for nine days, and then she died in my arms, and that's her older sister, who was three at the time. We buried her on a beautiful, snowy, wintry day in Oregon. And we ask ourselves when we lose loved ones, maybe you've lost a loved one, what is the end? What is the end game? Are those graves there the end of life? Is death the victor in the end, the end of life, the end of love, the end of hope? Is death the end game? Or are we creating a fantasy just to make us feel better? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see them one day. We'll, we'll be reunited. Just a little fantasy to appease our fear. Are we sure that there is a resurrection of the dead? Are we sure that we should be Christians and not Buddhists or Muslims or Hindus? What does Paul say? Paul says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, and if Christ did not rise from the dead, then our faith is vain, and we all, of all people are to be pitied. Jesus claimed to be God, and anyone can claim to be God. But then he claimed, his followers claimed he rose from the dead. So let's be detectives. Uh, something happened 2,000 years ago uh, that changed the course of history. It changed everything from the bottom up. History had a line drawn right through it. And there was an incident that happened, an occurrence that nobody could figure out. And that was the empty grave. It was an empty grave in Judea. And throughout history, nobody's figured out how the came, grave came to be empty. And it, it was so unusual that it changed a handful of his fishermen who were scared and, and uh, gutless and ran away when Jesus was taken to be crucified. And they convinced them to go out and change the world. They went all over the world. In fact, one of them came to India, St. Thomas, and, and witnessed to my ancestors. And, and we date our heritage back to that church in 51 AD. So we as detectives want to figure out how this grave came to be empty. So... Whenever you're going to start some detective endeavor, you should go back to some good detectives. Here's my friend, Jay Warner Wallace. He's a very famous cold case detective. He's been on 60 Minutes, one of, and he's, he's great about cold cases. So, like, for instance, recently, like, since recently, one of the last cases he did that he was on 60 Minutes for is he figured out a murder case in Silicon Valley that was 30 years old. Everybody involved in the murder, I mean, in the case, was dead. The, the original police officer, the victim's mother, and everything, uh, the only, the, only the murderer was still alive. So he goes back and he looks at all the, you know, all the casework and all, and he figures out how the murderer did it, and they convicted him and put him in jail 30 years later. So he's the expert in this. And so I was talking to him, and I said, so tell me, how does this all work? He said, well, there are two kinds of evidence, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence, right? Direct evidence supports the truth of an assertion directly without need for any additional evidence or inference, right? You see somebody shoot somebody, that's direct evidence, Circumstantial evidence is evidence that relies on an inference to connect it to the conclusion of fact, like forensic evidence, like a fingerprint of the scene of the crime. 
I mean, and that is like, you know, somebody leaves the, the crime, and, 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 it, and it turns out, he says, Neil, I, I don't know if you realize this, but most murder case convictions come from circumstantial evidence. He said, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because no, most people aren't going to murder somebody in plain daylight. They're going to do it behind when nobody can see him. So then there's no witnesses. So you've got to go and look at the gun and the, and, and, you know, and the, wit, and the people who heard them arguing or whatever. But you've got to come up with circumstantial evidence. In fact, circumstantial evidence has also freed people. So it's very powerful. So today we have to go back and look at the empty grave. And since nobody alive today was alive back then, we're only left with circumstantial evidence. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, Neil, how do we know the grave was empty? Isn't that just a legend? Well, let me turn that question around real fast. If the grave wasn't empty and the body of Jesus was still in the grave, how long would the story of Jesus' resurrection have lasted? Let me ask you this. What's the fundamental crux of Christianity? That Jesus is what? God. And he proved he was God by doing what? By rising from the dead, right? What does Paul say? Paul says right at the beginning, if there is no resurrection of the dead, or Christ does not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain and we of all people are to be pitied. In other words, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we Christians are deluded fools. And we're wasting our time here. So let me ask you this. Let's say it's 8033. It's about 50 days after Jesus had been crucified. And you want to stop this religion of Christianity. What's the easiest way to do it? What are they claiming? They claim that Jesus rose from the dead. What do you do? You say, well, there's the body. You go to the grave. You have a press conference. Hey, everybody, you know these crazy Christians? Body of Jesus, right here. End of religion. But they didn't do that. And here's the thing. The apostles weren't preaching the gospel in Rome 1,500 miles away. They were preaching it in where? In downtown Jerusalem. Now, how big is downtown Jerusalem? Massive. It takes you hours to cross the city. You know, it takes you eight minutes. And we hear... Peter's very first sermon, and what's interesting about this sermon is that this sermon was on Pentecost, and so a lot of the Jews from all around the world had come into uh, Jerusalem, and many of them did not speak Hebrew because they grew up in all these other countries. And so they come to Jerusalem, and while they're there, they visit all the holy places, and they're downtown, and all of a sudden this guy starts near the temple, and this guy starts preaching to them. And of course, they have no idea what he's saying because he's speaking in Hebrew or Aramaic. And they're like, oh, I have no idea. And then all of a sudden, these other disciples start translating because they've just been given the gift of tongues. And they start translating to all these, all these other languages. And what does he say? He says, and Peter says, And God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, for God would not allow the Holy One to undergo decay. I can confident, tell you confidently that Patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. What tomb is he talking about? The tomb I went to see 2,000 years later. And you know why all those Jews were there? Because it was a holy place. So they come out of town and they go to the studio. So that morning, all those Jews were at David's uh, bur uh, burial place. And they were, or they were going to go see it later. And then what does he say? He says this. He says, but Christ was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are witnesses of that fact. Now what did he just say? He says that Jesus died and rose again and in his grave. David died and he's still in his grave. And by the way, how far was Jesus' tomb? Right? David's tomb in Jerusalem. Jesus' tomb turns out was actually closer. Because if you look at David's tomb over there, Jesus' tomb was actually closer than David's tomb. Now let me ask you this. So we're talking about less than three quarters of a mile. We're talking Walmart. You guys all drove right by it on the way, right? So you walk into, let's say that last week or uh, 50 days ago, some famous person, pick any famous person you want, you know, died and was buried right near Walmart. And I come to you and I say, hey guys, this famous person rose from the dead. Now, even if you didn't care about it, 
Would you go check out the grave and say, his tomb is empty. Look, here's a tomb that's full. Right next to him is a tomb. Here's another tomb that is, not, is empty. This person rose from the dead. You're like, well, I'm gonna, it's only Walmart. I'll just walk over there. In fact, some of you parked there. And yet that day, how many people became Christians? 3,000. Folks, it was an empty tomb that an eight-year-old could have disproved. It was an empty tomb that a Roman official would have loved to disprove. It was an empty tomb that the, Ro- the Sanhedrin, the politicians of the day, would definitely have proved, disproved. By the way, I, th- I always like to throw this in. You know, the first time we see, in recorded in history, the very first time we see a republic in history, do you know where it is? People are like, oh, the Greeks. No. Exodus 18. You shall elect one man to be ruler over ten families, and then they shall elect a ruler. In fact, the word ruler means what? Legislator. In fact, the book of Judges really should be the book of rulers because the translation of the word judge that we've translated judge is really rulers because that's the book of rulers. You're like, why is it called judges? No, it's the book of rulers. In fact, if you look in the New Testament, we see that there was a rich young Ruler, think congressman, senator, right? And then Nicodemus was a ruler, right? So the rulers would have been loved to go and say, hey, we don't like this. We're going to get rid of this guy. Folks, for the religion of Christianity to survive, the key fact was that Jesus had to physically risen from the dead. The Jews weren't into any sort of metaphysical hogwash about symbolic or spiritual resurrections. I was talking to an atheist. He said, well, yeah, maybe back then they thought people rose from the dead all the time. I'm like, really? Really? How many history books have you read that said, oh yeah, pe- people believe people rose from the dead all the time. Look, if people rose from the dead all the time, they would not have used this as a key fact to proclaim, oh, Jesus rose from the dead. They'd be like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. What's the big deal? The fact was it was unusual. Nobody did that. And Romans and Jews and everybody knew that people didn't just up and rise from the dead. Without... The physical resurrection, Christianity would have nothing to stand on. Without an empty grave, Christianity would not have been launched. And yet that morning, 3,000 people became believers. Do you think any one of them said, eh, I'm just going to believe without looking at the grave? Even the older ones were like, hey, Joshua, go check out that grave and let me know if it's really empty. Dr. Gary Habermas, a really great professor of apologetics, uh, he does, by the way, he does this thing on the Shroud of Turin. And he says it's very interesting about the Shroud of Turin, and you should definitely watch his presentation on it. It's fascinating how much stuff there is on the Shroud of Turin. He says, um, he says that what the, the image on the Shroud of Turin was some sort of radiation or something. That's what caused the image, like some sort of alpha particle or something that happened. So, um, but what he did is he, he surveyed 30 years of German, French, and English critical scholarship relating to Jesus' resurrection. And he amassed a list of 2,200 sources. And he identifies 12 facts which are considered historical by a large majority of skeptical and conservative experts. So I want you to understand this. That, so even people who aren't Christians but are experts in the Bible have agreed to these facts. And these are the 12 facts. One of them is Jesus died by crucifixion. The second one was that Jesus was buried. In the last hour, somebody came and said, you went to them too fast, so I'm going to slow down. (laughs) The third, Jesus' death caused the disciples to despair and lose hope, believing that his life was ended. Number four, the tomb was discovered to be empty just a few days later. Number five, the disciples had experiences which they believed were the literal appearances of the risen Jesus. Number six, the disciples were transformed from doubters afraid to identify themselves with Jesus to bold proclaimers of his death and resurrection. Number seven, this resurrection message was the center of preaching in the early church. Number eight, this message was especially proclaimed in Jerusalem, as we showed, where Jesus died and was buried shortly before. Number nine, as a result of this preaching, the church was founded and grew. Number 10, Sunday became the day of worship instead of the Shabbat or Saturday. Number 11, James, the brother of Jesus, the skeptic, was converted to the faith when he believed he saw the risen Jesus. He was then executed for his faith. And Josephus told us that, right? We we didn't even need the Bible for that. 
And number 12, Paul, a persecutor of Christianity, was also converted by an experience which he likewise believed to be an appearance of the resurrected Jesus. So these are the 12 minimal facts. I play a game. When I teach this to junior high, high school, and college, I, and sometimes adults, I play a game. I break them up into groups and I say, okay, here's your task. You guys have to take the minimal facts and explain to me how the grave of Jesus came to be empty. And then they have to come up with a theory. They have like 30 minutes to come up with a theory. And then we, we, everybody shares their theory. And then all the other groups get to, to say why it's stupid. It's always a lot of fun because we get all these weird theories. And so I recommend you do that. Go home today before Easter and come up with a theory that fits all the minimal facts but explains the empty grave without using the resurrection, without using the supernatural. And, come up, and then send me an email if you think your theory is really good. Because I'll collect them. So the grave could have been emptied by two means, right? The natural means and or a supernatural means. But we're detectives. We're not going to jump. I'm a scientist. I'm an engineer. I have degrees in physics and stuff. So I'm not going to jump to the supernatural. I want to look at the natural means, right? So I want to understand what are the natural things. And the first obvious reason. So let's put on our hat and say, okay, we're here. How did the grave come to be empty? So let's look at the first possibility. Well, the first possibility is that it was moved, stolen by the disciples, right? I mean, this is what the... The uh, Jewish people, the Jewish uh, rulers said, oh, yeah, they stole the, 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 the body. Okay, well, now, this turns out to be one of the easiest claims to disprove. Right, now, I, this next fact, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to prove this, next, this fact, uh, this uh, option uh, in two different ways, or disprove this option in two different ways. One, I'm going to use something that's not a minimal fact, because I think it's kind of fun to look at it. So the first one, the non-minimal fact, was that the tomb was probably guarded by Roman soldiers. So I looked through the internet and I found a real picture of Roman soldiers. The color technology was amazing back then. Really impressed. Um, you know, like Abraham Lincoln said, you can't trust everything you see on the internet. And I read that on the internet too. So anyway, so, uh, so, anyway, so, so the Roman guards, but so Polybius, I didn't read this on the internet. <laughs> There's actually a book on it. Polybius says the Roman guard had 16 members usually, and these guys were not, were very nice, kind, gentle people. Yeah, not. Uh, so, they, and they were professional killers. They're probably mercenaries. And they, their job was to guard, well, let's say this is the tomb of Jesus. Their job was to guard the tomb. Um, and if they lost whatever they were guarding, they would be executed. So it made sense that they would fight for their lives. That was how they made sure that. Um, so the way it would work is that they would uh, do this in a very systematic way, says Polybius. Four men would guard the front of the tomb, and out of 16, and the other 12 would relax, and if they did go to sleep, they would relax in a semicircle, and they would sleep um, with their heads in. So you couldn't bash your feet. Um, so you couldn't bash your heads uh, if you tried to attack them. So this is what would have to happen. So we have the disciples who are fishermen, 12 disciples, oh, actually 11. Uh, one of them is a very brave and bold tax collector. So that, maybe that counts for something. The rest of them are fishermen. And uh, what do you think the odds are for 11 fishermen or for 10 fishermen, one tax collector and 16 trained killers? Anybody betting on this? But anyway, so these, these guys come in, and they, they first bash their feet of the guys who are sleeping. And then they come in, and they attack the four. Uh, they, they charge into it. They move the stone somehow or the other. I know it's round, but in the picture, it's square. A Hindu guy drew this for me, so he didn't realize it was, uh, he was, uh, it was round. But anyway, so they grab the sepulchre. They, they, they grab, go into the tomb, pick up the, uh, uh, the body of Jesus. They run out, and they hide it. And they say, look, he's risen. Now, Given all that, and I agree that this is kind of a, uh, we don't know, it's not one of the minimal facts, but here's the thing that isn't, is it very interesting, is the faith of all the apostles. In fact, look at, cruci uh, Peter was crucified upside down, Andrew was crucified, Simon was crucified, the first James was beheaded, the second James was hauled alive in pieces, Bartholomew was flayed alive with knives, Thomas came to India, witnessed to my ancestors, became, converted them, and then he was speared there. Jude was killed by arrows. Matthew was killed in Ethiopia. Philip was killed in Aeropolis. In addition, two other potential plotters, James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned to death, as Josephus tells us. Paul, the spread of the gospel, hated Christians and became one and was executed in Rome for it. Now, I want you to imagine the scene right after Jesus has been crucified and buried. And Paul, Peter says, guys, I have an idea. Okay, so here's the plan. We'll fight the guards. 
get the body out of the tomb and stash it somewhere, then we'll come back and tell a story that will probably have us hunted, hated, whipped, stoned, poor, powerless, and finally get us all killed. And we never change our minds. So who's all with me on this? I mean, the fundamental basis for all their death sentences was precisely that they claimed Jesus was God and rose from the dead to prove it. Nobody was out to kill them because they claimed Jesus said, love your neighbor. That's nonsense. Jesus was a threat. He said a lot more than that. The Romans hated the Jews, I mean the Christians, because they said Caesar was not God. The Jews hated the Christians because they said Jesus was God. And everybody else hated the Christians because they said Jesus was the only God. And not one of the disciples recanted their story. I mean, all of them could have said, you know, they could have said, you know, you know, when we started this, we thought we would get money, sex, and power. And we didn't get any of that. So uh, I'm sorry. I, I, can I just go back to fishing now? Look, you might die for a lie that somebody else tells you. 9-11 hijackers, the Nazis, whatever. But what sort of idiot would die for a lie that they had made up themselves and knew was false and they didn't get anything out of it? The minimal facts also refute the stolen theory. <laughs> okay, let's look at the next one, the wrong tomb. Maybe they didn't steal the body. Maybe they just was mistaken and went to the wrong tomb. So there is the right tomb and there is the wrong tomb. And so we have uh, Marys, all the Marys, right? They... Uh, go to the wrong tomb. They go, oh, it's empty. And then they run and they tell Peter and John and Peter and John run to it and John says, and I beat Peter there. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then they go and they go, oh, look, look, the tomb is empty. Oh, he's, he's risen, right? And then meanwhile, the guards are like sitting here going, people are going, ah, ah, right? And they're like, unless the guards were guarding the wrong tomb, which wouldn't make sense because they're like, look, we've got to put a seal on it. We've got to make sure what we're guarding is there because otherwise they're going to come and kill us. So we better make sure that what's in there is there. And then they put a seal on it and then they guard it. So they can't be guarding the wrong tomb. And then of course there's Joseph of Arimathea whose tomb, who owns a tomb, who's also a Christian. And he goes, um, did I bury Jesus in tomb A or tomb B? I know that was only three days ago, but man, I'm getting really old these days. Anyone buying that? And besides, if it was the wrong tomb, what do you think the Jewish leaders would have done? Guys, you guys are idiots. Look, there's a real tomb. Let me show you the body of Jesus. It's only been three days. Or even if it was on Pentecost, 50 days. It's only been 50 days. We can show you that the body's still there, and that's Jesus. So it could have been the wrong tomb, and the minimal facts refute the wrong tomb, too. Okay, so let's look at the next one. And the next one is it was moved by the Jews of the Romans. I can get rid of this right away, because if the Jews of the Romans had moved it, even if they didn't have the body of Jesus anymore, they would have just said, hey, guys, we moved it. End of story. But instead, what did they say? What did they say? You stole the body. Why would they say that if they had moved it? Or had the body. So that also it doesn't work. And it's also refuted by some of the same minimal facts. Okay. So let's look at the next one. And this is the hallucination theory. Uh, you know, Peter was stoned. Mary was stoned. Uh, <laughs> Peter, Paul, and Mary were all stoned. Some of the older people know that one. Look, I assure you, I read their biography. They tell me for sure that Puff the Magic Dragon had nothing to do with drugs, okay? So don't go there. Besides, Paul Stuckey did become a, a Christian. But anyway, but I mean, I, I realize that if you look at it, you know, uh, Stephen was stoned, Paul was stoned, uh, Peter was stoned, uh, but that's not the stoning we're talking about, okay? Some of the young kids are like, what? <laughs> Ask an older person, they'll explain it to you. The problem is that more than 500 people saw Jesus risen from the dead, not to mention the disciples. And, the, and, and psychologists will tell you if two people see the exact same thing and de can describe in detail, detail, it's not a hallucination. It really happened. And of course, the minimal facts refute that too. Okay, so then comes to one of my favorite theories. That's the Dave theory or the twin theory. Um, this is the theory. I mean, you think about it. How could you explain a risen Jesus? Well, the easiest way is to explain it with a twin, an identical twin. I mean, we knew there were twins there, right? Because Didymus, Thomas the twin. Um, and, and so we knew there were twins there. But here's the problem. If there is a twin, how do you get a twin into the picture 
you has to be a twin that your mom doesn't know about and your brother doesn't know about. You see the difficulty here? It's like he's got to have an identical twin that nobody knows is, exists, right? So, you know, there was a movie called Dave, and that's... Um, and, and the, the guy looks like just like the president, so he pretends to be the president and all that stuff. So that's, that's where the Dave theory comes from. There's a, a great philosopher, William Lane Craig, great apologist. And he's arguing with this guy named Greg Cavan. Greg Cavan is a professor in biblical studies, but he's not a Christian. And I always go, why? <laughs> why would you dedicate your life to something that you didn't even believe in? Okay, so, so he had studied all the evidence, and he says the only possibility is the twin theory, but he's got to figure out how to explain how the mom and the brother are both Christians and don't know that uh, Jesus is a twin. So he comes up with this, and, and if you go online and look up William Name Craig Dave theory, you'll, you'll be able to find the whole debate. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and you'll have a lot of laughs. Uh, uh, William McCray is a great debater and, and just very gentle. He's, he's, not, he's not rude or anything. He's very matter of fact, very reasonable, very rational. Uh, so this is the theory that Cavan comes up with. He says, Jesus was born in a cave in Bethlehem, and it was very dark in the cave, and right next to him was another couple who also couldn't find place at the end, but they had identical twins. You know where this is going, right? Somehow in the darkness of the cave, and I call them Dieter and Jeter. I don't know why, I just thought. Somehow in the darkness of the cave, Jesus, the real Jesus, gets accidentally swapped by Dieter. And so I'm trying to think, how can this happen? Like, what are the possibilities of this happening? I mean, you know your child, so this is the only thing I can think of. Mary's like, he's got, she's got Jesus, and there's the real manger of Jesus, and here's the manger of Dieter and Dieter. And, and you know, Jeter's probably off... Uh, getting his diaper changed or something. And, 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 uh, and Mary goes and lays down Jesus right next to Dieter. And she goes, oh, uh, wait, wait. Uh, and she walks away and goes, oh, no, that's not our, our manger. She goes back and she picks up the wrong child, Dieter, and puts him in their manger. I mean, that's the only way I can think of it. So, but so understand what happens as a result of this. So Dieter goes off to Egypt and then later to Nazareth. He grows up thinking that his name is Jesus. He starts preaching love, and so people want to kill him. No, no, not really. But, um, so he starts preaching that he's God, and people try wanting to kill him. So he thinks he's God. And Dieter and Jesus go off to some other part of Jerusalem, and they grow up. And they're like, well, I think we're twins, but we don't look anything alike. But hey, that's fine. Uh, you know, maybe we're just fraternal twins. So, um, and then one day they're walking through Jerusalem. 33 years later, and they see this scene. And there's Dieter, who got swapped with Jesus' birth, and he's crucified. And there's Jesus, the real Jesus, who thinks he's Dieter. But then there's his quote-unquote identical twin brother, Dieter, and he notices the man on the cross looks just like him. And so he decides to pretend that he's, he goes, hey, Dieter, I have an idea. After they bury him, let's attack the grave, the guards of the grave, kill them all, take the body of, of this Jesus guy, we'll bury him somewhere, and I'll pretend to be him. Is this working for you? I mean, I'm trying to think how it would work. You know, he shows up and goes, hi, you must be Martha. No, I'm your mother, Mary. Oh, sorry. Uh, you must be Jude. No, I'm James, your brother. You must be Peter. No, I'm John. How dare you think I'm Peter? He's an old, craggy, crabby old man. I mean, he doesn't know anybody. And they're like, wow, James is like, man, after he rose from the dead, his head is all messed up. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What does it take? Do you have any, how many people have brothers? Okay. What would it take to convince you that your brother is God? <laughs> and not some deluded lunatic. Somebody in the last section says, I, I'd, I'd be easier to believe that he is Satan, right? <laughs> But yet, James says, I'm, if James dies, believing that, I mean, this just, just, I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. And the main theory is that James, the brother of Jesus, recognized Jesus as God. So the last theory that, you know, I mean, there are a few other weird theories that just fall apart immediately. I don't spend time on them. Is the swoon theory. And this was a, a popular thing. You know, somebody said, well, you know, the, the Romans didn't know much about death. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe he swooned. In fact, one guy wrote a book called The Passover Plot, and he said, oh, it was like Romeo and Juliet. They slipped him a drug. He, he thought, I mean, everybody thought he was dead, but he was comatose. And then once he was in the uh, tomb, he woke up, and then everybody thought he had risen, to, risen 
uh, risen from the dead. So here's the problem. Most people don't bother to learn the details about crucifixion and what could have happened and what couldn't have happened. So I want to go back through the crucifixion and I want to talk about what happens this week from now till Friday. Okay? So on Thursday night next week, Jesus gathers in the uh, upper room and he says this. He says, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. And then the Bible says he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. If you've ever been to Israel and you stood out, you can see, you can see all, of, all of Jerusalem from the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a beautiful sight. And he prays earnestly. And in being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And the sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, some of us may be predisposed to say, well, that's just creative language. It's metaphorical. Yeah, but it isn't. You see, there's this condition called hematidrosis. It's an affliction caused by high psychological stress. You see, what happens is severe anxiety causes the release of internal hormones and chemicals that break down the capillaries in your sweat glands. And as a result, you bleed into the sweat glands, so it looks like you're sweating drops of blood. It's a real condition. And the more agonies you are, the more stressed you are, the more you bleed. Our Lord was in great mental anguish, and at the moment he's suffering from hematidrosis. And even more heartbreaking is that it leaves the skin extremely fragile, so the skin becomes extremely sensitive and tender, and at times painful to the touch. And it's so heartbreaking because the next day, what does he get? He gets 39 lashes. History tells us that the Roman 39 lashes were from a whip of braided leather thongs with metal balls and bone woven into them. When the whip would strike the flesh, the balls would cause deep bruises and the bone would cut the flesh severely. If the soldier doing the whipping was in extra foul mood, the cuts and intensity of the whipping could shred the back so much that the spine of the victim was sometimes exposed. The whipping would have gone all the way down the soldier to the back, to the back of his legs. It was, it was just terrible. One physician who has studied Roman beating said, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Eusebius, a third century historian, says the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. My friends, Isaiah 53.5, which predicts this, talks about the crucifixion, and I recommend you read this this week says he was beaten for our transgression, and by his stripes we are healed. As a result of this, Jesus goes into hypovolemic shock. What is hypovolemic shock? A shock caused by a low volume of blood. The heart races to try and pump blood that isn't there. Blood pressure drops, causing fainting or collapsing. Remember that line. The kidney stops producing urine to try and maintain what liquid is left in the body. Remember... Um, and, and let's go back to Psalm 22. And the body becomes extremely thirsty as the body craves fluids to replace the lost blood volume. Remember Psalm 22:15 says, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. What happens when Jesus is walking to the cross with his, with, um, to the Calvary with his cross? He what? He faints, he stumbles and falls, and they call in Simon the Cyrene to lift it for him. And then when he gets to the cross, what does Jesus say? He says, I thirst. He was suffering from hypovolemic shock. When Jesus got got to Golgotha, the place where he used to be crucified, the soldiers would then tie his arms and his legs to the cross, and then they would nail him. But we see pictures of nailings and, you know, Jesus with holes right here. But that's not where it would happen. The nailing was actually right here, because if you put a hole right here, it doesn't hold your arms up, not even forget about your body. So they would have to go right here, which would be, and this is from a, uh, this is from crucified victims we've seen. We would see that the bone would go right here, and this, uh, the nail would go right here, which would hold up your hand, uh, your arm. And this was what we call where, is where your median nerve is. You can actually push down on it, and you'll feel a bit of it. It's protected by the bone, but it's right there, right? Now, here's what's interesting about the median, or, or tragic about the median nerve. It's just like the funny bone, the humerus nerve. And the more you squeeze it, the more painful it gets. And so the idea is that if you put a nail right there, every time you move, you're squeezing that nerve, or if you've already cut it and you're squeezing it. And it was so painful that they created a name for that. It means, the word is excruciating, which means out of the cross. 
And then they say him do the same thing with his other hand and then his feet. Archaeologists found a crucified victim dating back to the first century AD. Uh, one thing they noticed is that the nail was right through the heel. Does this remind you of something? The Bible says that they have pierced my hands and my feet. And that's written 900 years before Christ, long before the Romans were even active on the scene, long before the Romans invented crucifixion. And yet the Bible prophesies that the Messiah will have his hands pierced and his feet pierced. And so once Jesus' wrists were nailed, they would pull on his shoulder and dislocate both of his, both of his shoulders. Why? Well, first of all, Psalm 22 says what? My bones are out of joint. So they raise the cross after they dislocate his shoulders, and what happens is he falls forward like this. Now, when you fall forward like that, your lungs are in an exhale position. You can't take a breath unless you do what? You can't pull yourself up because your bones are out of, your arms are out of its socket. So you've got to push down on the nail in your heel and then you've got to take a breath. And then all the weight and the pressure and the pain and the fainting, you're going to not be able to, and the pain on your medium nerve here, you're going to fall back down until you realize you've got to go back up for another breath. And you do this over and over again and you're supposed to last three or four days until finally you have no energy and you just die on the cross. If you recall, the soldiers came by and broke the legs of the two thieves. Why did they do that? So they couldn't push themselves up. So they would die of suffocation. Why? Because the next day was the Shabbat, and they didn't want any bodies to be left hanging on the Shabbat. And so the Romans said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll handle that. We don't want to ride on our hands. So they did that. They came, but when they came to Jesus, now remember, crucifixion was not supposed to kill you right away. It was supposed to be an example of how you should never do what the, never cross the Roman rulers. You should obey everything they did because, you know, you're going to end up on that cross just like that guy. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. They didn't need to break his legs. So, go, well, there you go. Maybe he swooned. But here's the problem. If you swoon on the cross, if you faint on the cross, what happens to you? You suffocate because you can't push yourself up to breathe. And it's not a small movement. It's a massive movement. You've got to release all the pressure in your lungs. So you can't, like, sneak a breath like this. So how did Jesus die? I listened to an interview by a doctor who studying uh, <clears throat> the conditions that led up to Jesus. And he says, uh, the way Jesus died was um, his blood goes into a sort of a shock. And what happens is it can't clot. So you start bleeding and you keep bleeding and you stop, it can't, nothing stops the flow of blood. And Jesus dies of a massive blood loss as his blood pours out for us. My friends, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him the sin of us all. Prophecy written hundreds of years before Christ. Jesus was dead. And then Luke says this. Luke says, It was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. Now, the way they counted was the first hour was 6 a.m. for us. So they sounded the sunrise was hour one. So sixth hour would be noon. And darkness, ninth hour would be 3 p.m., right? So there was about sixth hour and there was darkness over the earth and the sun was darkened. Matthew 27, 51 says, And there, behold, then behold, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in through from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Why was the veil torn in two? Because the veil was a veil between the Holy of Holies and everyone else. And once the veil was torn in two, what was God saying? You are free to enter into his presence. Because the price for your sin has been paid. And this all lines up with what Joel says 540 years before Christ. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For a Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. 
Now, here's the problem, though. That's an eclipse and an earthquake we're talking about. Now, earthquakes are hard to discover in the past. But I can tell you every single eclipse that has ever happened. Why? Because we have astronomical charts. We can go back and see where the moon was and where the sun was, where the earth was. We can calculate all that. And there's a problem here. There is no eclipse around that time in Jerusalem. So the atheist goes, ah, see? Oh, maybe Jesus died on the cross, but that's all made up. Until you read the historian Fliegen Trillinus, who uh, had to suffer under a name like that, but besides that, uh, he records in his history, he was not a Christian, and he records in his history about the Olympiads, okay? So he says this. He's got not even talking about Christianity. He says, in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, which, by the way, is AD 33, as far as we can figure out, a failure of the sun took place greater than any previously known, and night came on at the sixth hour of the day. That's noon. So the stars actually appeared in the sky, and a great earthquake took place in Bithynia and overthrew a greater part of Nicaea. Yeah, it wasn't an eclipse. It was something far, far more powerful than that. Jesus was dead. Roman historians tell us that it takes no less than four executioners to verify a dead person. Why? Because if that dead person showed up in the marketplace a few days later, the executioners would <laughs> take his place. Right? So they were very intimate with every form of death. They were experts in torturing and prolonging death. And they were experts in killing. So some Roman centurion comes up and he lances Jesus' chest cavity. And what comes out? Blood and water. Right? Read, read, read. It's, uh, you definitely should read it. Read the accounts. Especially this week. Now, not knowing anything else but this fact, blood and water came out of the chest cavity, a doctor can tell you immediately that the victim was dead. How? The technical reason? The heart is stopped, which results in collection of the fluid in the membrane around the heart, which is called pericardial effusion. It's a very thick, waxy thing. As well as collection of fluid around the lungs, which is called pleural effusion. Now, when your heart is beating, all this mixes together, but when... The blood stops moving, it separates. The red blood cells separate from the pericardial or per pleural effusion, right? So if you slant somebody in the heart area, even if you don't hit his heart, the fact that you see blood separated from the pleural effusion or pericardial effusion means that the heart is not what? It's not beating. It's not making not, You could get that on your leg and you may have gangrene or something, but when you get it around the chest area, that means the heart has not only stopped beating, but it stopped beating for long enough for that to separate, which means the person is dead. And by the way, this effusion is a very waxy looking fluid. But given all that, the, the death blow to this, which is actually given to us by an atheist, Dick, Dr. Dave Strice, is an opponent of Christianity, he mocks the swoon theory, and this is how he tells you why it doesn't work. Let me tell you why the swoon theory, he says, doesn't work. It's impossible that a being who had stolen half dead out of the sepulcher, the tomb, who crept about weak and ill, wanting medical treatment, who required bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, could have given to the disciples the impression that he was conqueror over the death and the grave and the prince of life. An impression which lay at the bottom of the future ministry. Let me tell you what he's saying. He said, look, let's say Jesus managed to wake up in the tomb. Maybe he fainted or maybe he had the, the drug that, you know, in the Passover plot they talk about. And then he wakes up and goes, man, I have a splitting headache. Oh, I got holes all over me, man. I must have had a bad day. Oh, man. Right. Well, okay. Let's see if I can move the stone here. Oh, oh, oh. And he walks out there, and then the soldiers are like, oh, uh, that's very interesting. Get him! No, they're like, no, no, he's gone. Let's run away, right? No, they're going to get him. Okay, but let's say he manages to scare them, uh, and he, <laughs> he walks into town, and he runs into Peter, and Peter goes, he's gone! No, he's going to say, hey, get a doctor. The man just survived a crucifixion. That's not miraculous. Say, he's not, as the Monty Python has said, he's not dead yet. I'm feeling better. But here's the other thing. is you see, the disciples didn't just say we saw an empty grave. They said they'd seen him, they'd touched him, they watched him eat, they saw him ascend into heaven. 
And then they died for that personal claim. In fact, what's very interesting about this, a lot of us don't realize this, but the apostles had apostles. And the apostles of the apostles wrote a lot of stuff, wrote a lot of sermons. We have a lot of history of that. We have their sermons. We, we kind of know when some of them were born. We know when they died. Uh, we have a lot of information. So Peter had an apostle named Clement, Clement of Rome. Well, Clement of Rome says Peter told me personally in his sermons that he saw the risen Christ. And then, of course, there's Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. And Polycarp says this. He says, John reiterated six times to him that John had seen the, that Christ has risen. Now, I like to imagine this. So, like, Polycarp's like, so, John, you really saw Jesus rise from the dead and, and saw him alive. So I was like, dude, I told you six times, man. What is this? What, do you think I'm lying? You think I've been beaten and boiled and, and tortured and exiled just because I always wanted to have fun? I mean, Polycarp, yes, I saw him. And then Polycarp goes and dies for that claim. And of course, the minimal facts just refuse the swoon theory. So the swooning doesn't work, which means the natural means don't work. So we're left with the supernatural means. Now, I want to put the supernatural means in context here. If you'd been following, if, you'd, if we'd done this in the, right, in the sequence, uh, we would know by this time that it's more rational than God exists using science. Right? Big Bang Theory proves that. And the book, Agent X, talks about it. In fact, the, Agent X talks about up to the, there are up to six supernatural dimensions. Right? Um, and then we talk about how Jesus existed, which we just did. And then we talked about the minimal facts, which we just did. So given all of this, it's more rational to think that the elimination and the elimination of all possible solutions were only left with one option. What is that? The resurrection really happened. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, think about this. If God can create a universe creating matter, energy, and time out of nothing, then raising himself from the dead is an easy task. But only a god could do it. So if you're a detective and you put on your detective hat, you, go, you first look at all the probables, and you say, well, the probable is impossible, then the improbable must be possible. And that's where we're at, because you see, Christianity isn't a blind faith, it's a rational faith built on a solid historical and logical foundation. The grave was empty because Jesus Christ really rose from the dead physically. There is no other natural, there's no other logical, there's no other historical, archaeological possibility. And not only did the disciples claim they saw him, but 500 other people claimed they saw him. And that one of them was a man named Paul who was persecuting Christians and then became a Christian. That's like Hitler persecuting the Jews and then becoming a Jew. What would convince somebody to do that? What would convince... You to believe your brother was God. What would convince James, who actually mocks Jesus in the earlier part of the, in part of the gospel, to then become the leader of the church and die for that? See, Jesus said, I am God, and I'm going to prove that to you by dying and rising from the dead. Something that can't be faked. Now, if he really was God, then what he said is really important. He said, people who don't believe that I am God don't want to have a relationship with me. See, you were designed for a relationship with God. God designed you precisely the way you are so that he could have a relationship with you. Yeah, he wants a relationship with all of us, but every one of us is different because he wants that relationship with you. But if you don't want a relationship with him, he's not going to force you into that. And he will allow you to spend eternity away from him. We call that hell. We call that spiritual death. But if you want a relationship with him, there's a problem because God has this dilemma. God is a just God. He has to be a just judge. But he's also a loving God. So he's got a dilemma. Imagine that you, you're, and, and I've said this before when I was up on the stage. I said, imagine Paris thought your sister gets raped and they catch the rapist and they, they take him to the judge. And the judge says, I am a loving judge. So I forgive you, Mr. Rapist. You may go free. Is that a good judge? That's a California judge. <laughs> right? It's a bad judge. So if God were to just forgive all of us for all our rebellions and all the bad things we've done, then he's not a good judge. He's not a just judge. He's an evil judge. So he has to punish us. But he's a loving God. And he says, look, I got an idea. He didn't really say that. 
But God is in, has ingenuity and he goes, hey, I can do both at the same time. I'm going to be a just judge. I'm going to require the punishment, but I will pay the punishment myself. But you don't get the punishment unless you repent and you accept him and you accept the punishment. And that's what the gospel is. Christ had to die to pay for all the horrible, evil things of mankind. And God loves you. You need to make that decision. That is the decision you have to make today. When I started this, I mentioned my daughter, Caroline Lewis. You know, she spent nine days in neonatal intensive care as my mom and my wife, um, and she died in my arms. My sister-in-law, Susan, was there, um, and she went from her father's arms to our father's arms. It's quite a blessing and tragic, but I would never have, I, want, I needed to be there. But here's the reality. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then we have no hope. Amen. That sea of graves is our destiny. The vast expanse of graves represents the end, the end of dreams, the end of hopes, the end of life, the end of you. Death is the end game if that is the end. But that verse goes on. It says, but Christ has been in raised from, in, indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits who have fallen asleep. And if that is true, then our hope is real. It's not some pleasant fantasy that we delude ourselves into believing, oh yeah, I don't need to face death because I'm going to see them again. Because it's real. You know, after, a few years after Caroline died, my daughter, Mary Catherine, she was three when Caroline died and she was six when she asked me this question. We're driving, driving down the road and she says, Dad, when Caroline died, was it like falling asleep? And now, you know, being a father, and I don't want her to be living her life in fear of death, right? So I said, yeah, honey, it's just like falling asleep. And I remember driving down a little ways, and, and then I said, honey, no, that's not true. Not true at all. And now you have to understand, Mary Catherine had grown up listening to me speak about the dimensions and about Agent X and all that stuff and teaching about that, and in fact, writing the book. Um, and I said, honey, you remember the dimensions? She goes, yeah. I said, you remember how, you know, there's ten dimensions, but we only experience four. But when Christ died, his body became a ten-dimensional body. How did Christ get into the upper room with the doors locked? If you look at the book, it tells you how he steps over the third dimension. And he talks about how angels and demons, he calls into all that. He said, so, so when that happened, when he trans, trans transformation in the grave from dead being to a live ten-dimensional body, it emits some sort of radiation, right, which may explain the Shroud of Turin. But the point is that there is a multiple dimensions out there. I said, honey, so remember when, when, when we go out, in fact, when you go out to lunch right after this, you're going to eat something good, hopefully. And if you have any taste, you'd be eating steak, right? <laughs> you know? Somebody asked if I was vegan. I said, no, everything I eat is vegan. <laughs> I mean, think about it. That's kosher, right? We don't eat any mammal that eats another mammal, right? Well, we shouldn't, at least. So, okay. So, um, so, uh, so you're going to eat steak. And uh, steak, steak is delicious, but that's three-dimensional steak. Imagine if you were eating ten-dimensional steak. Now, what about chocolate? Women, chocolate. Four-dimensional chocolate, right? Beautiful chocolate. Imagine 10-dimensional chocolate. We just heard the, the praise and worship team here, and they, were, they, they were, did, did such a marvelous job, and you'll hear them again. And they're giving us three-dimensional, four-dimensional music. Imagine 10-dimensional music. You know, I spent 10 years working for Dolby Labs, and my job was to design the most accurate monitor. If you buy a TV that says Dolby Vision, I'm the hardware architect for it. And, and we would spend hours and hours, and in fact, days and months, just trying to get the color accuracy just right. So green on this TV was green on that TV, and everything was exact. But that's just four-dimensional color. Imagine the vibrancy of 10-dimensional color. 
And today, we have three-dimensional, four-dimensional relationships. Imagine ten-dimensional relationships. I said, Mary Catherine, no, when Caroline fell asleep, I mean, when Caroline died, it wasn't like falling asleep. It was like waking up. My friends, <laughs> death is not the end game. He is risen. He is risen indeed. As the band comes up, I want to lead you in prayer. I've explained the gospel to you, and I've explained the logical reasons. I don't want you to make an emotional decision although our emotions can never be far apart. I want you to decide. I want you to decide if you are going to follow Jesus and obey him. Not because it's an emotional decision, which is very important too, but because it's logically, factually, physically, scientifically true. If that's the case, and this is the first time, I want you to pray with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Pray with me. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that you died to pay for that sin. I repent of my sin. I want you to save me. I want to be a believer because it makes sense. It's true. And it can be proven to be true. If you prayed that prayer for the first time with every eyes closed, every head bowed, pop your hand up real quick so we can see. And if you do believe, I want to meet you, but you don't have to feel, don't feel obliged, but go to the back and say, I'd like a new believers package. They'll just give you one. And if you want to talk to somebody, we'd love to talk to you, but don't, don't worry about it. Just remember this decision this time. And then join us for eternity with your new body and with everlasting life. Amen. God bless you.